This is the 14th of May of 2023, and the title of this message is He Always Knows Best. Before we go further, we're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to forgive us for known and unknown sins. We ask that you put your hedge of protection around us. And I'm talking about everyone that is listening to the sound of my voice. And put your protection over the airwaves and the phone right now, the recording device. And over your word and over this study and only the only your word goes forth. Holy Spirit, I ask you to attach to every word and upload this video quickly. In Jesus' name. Well, we're going to start off with simple truth. Okay, we're going to first look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Okay, we're going to look at Isaiah 42, 7. Isaiah 42, 7. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sat in darkness out of the prison house. Now we're going to look at um, Isaiah 9 2. Go to Isaiah 9 2. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. And then right before uh, I started to record this video, Holy Spirit put on my heart to do, to do uh, also John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and... Uh, the darkness comprehended it not. Now, this study is about coming into the light. Okay? So, the truth is, when we are called, or when we are doing the work of God, you become that target. You become that big light for the demons. You become a torch in the darkness. That's just how it is. And demons will flock to you and they'll poke and prod and they'll use anybody and any means that they can to hurt you and to get your mind off the mission that God had given you or the plan of God. You know, this is not, in reality, it's really not only an attack on humanity or on the person that's got the calling on their life, but it's an attack on our creator. And we know who does that. Satan, Lucifer, that old devil, the serpent, the one that, the fallen one, you know, he's the one, he's the father of lies. The word says it all started with him. John 10, 10 says that. So, you know, the, the truth is the people that have a call in their life, the evangelists, the pastors, the any kind of minister, the true ones. I'm not talking about the false ones. I'm talking about the true followers of Christ. The true ministers of Christ are a huge red target. They become a torch in the darkness. And like I just said, they, the demons flock to that. And this is why we need to continue to pray for people that are sharing the word and teaching the word, the ministers and all those ones I just named. We need to t we need to stand up for truth. 
And we need to continue to pray for the ones that are standing up for truth. And we need to continue to pray for the ones that have a calling on their lives. And you will know them by their fruits. So you will know that, that they are called. And that's a form of judging because you've got to judge to live in this world. Or else you wouldn't know what's good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong. You'd be falling for any, any kind of doctrine. Any kind of whatever people say. And, and you definitely don't want to do that. And this, it's the Holy Spirit indwelling is so needed. Especially right now. Okay, so if you ever wonder why this is happening, uh, you'll wonder what you're doing wrong. Why is this going on? Why don't God love me? All that is from Satan himself. They're lies from hell. There is a point that we will be chastised Especially if we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing. And the ones that are called, the scriptures say, much is given, much is required. They will be chastised the hardest. Now it's a hard issue. Are you going to say, Father, forgive me? Or are you going to say something that anybody else has forgiven that has offended you? Or hurt you in some way? Or that you have hurt them with your speech or your act actions? Are you going to say, forgive me? Jesus said, you know, the offenses must come, but woe to that one it comes to. And what he's talking about, you got the choice to say, I forgive you, or please forgive me, even if you think you didn't do nothing wrong. He honors you because you have, ex you have brought yourself low. Okay, and we're going to get into that in a little bit here too. So, you know, the ways that he attacks you, and it's also prevalent. People from church, people from your groups, people from the internet, people from your, like I said, you know, your work, your co-workers, your, even your boss, man. I've been through that one that many times. Your children, even your spouse. But the, the thing, the fact is, they don't know what they're doing. Remember Jesus said to the, the uh, said to the people that were around him that were, the ones that nailed him to the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And the fact is, most of these people, some of them do, but most of them don't know that they're being used by Satan. The demons are using them. And I've seen that more than a few times. And the Holy Spirit has given me the gift of, of knowing that that's a demonic act, that's a demon speaking through them. That's happened more than one time. Now, I'm at the end where, you know, forgive me if I have offended anybody because I tell the truth as it is. And my thing, I've got to learn. Now, I'll be serious here. For, I'll be serious here. I am serious. You know, I've got to learn. Sometimes it's better not to say nothing, even though it is the truth. You see, because, you know, people take that and they, they get hurt by it and offended by it. And then you got to go and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. But, you know, this is the word of God. So that's another thing. You either stand up for righteousness. Or you're going to fall for all the doctrines and the lies and the deceptions that are out there. Okay, you know, even Jesus was demonically attacked. And you know why I say demonically attacked? I'm talking spiritually, mentally, physically, financially, emotionally. And, yeah, your loved ones, too. The demons will attack your loved ones. All to get you off the mission that you have been sent to do. And, to, you know, to thwart the plan of God, in other words. And, like I said, Jesus had this wilderness experience. That word, if. Remember this word when we come, because I'm going to read to you Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. Remember, if. If is a word that has a question mark. So we're going to read Matthew 4, 1 to 11. When Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil... 
Okay, um, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, least at any time thou foot dash against a stone. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. We're going to look at a couple things here. Okay, in 4, um, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Why did he say that? You see, bread... Uh, even if it has preservatives in it, there's going to come a day you're going to find mold on that bread, right? So it disintegrates. It's no good after a while. But the Word of God, remember Jesus said, not one, taught, not one uh, dot or tittle will fade away. And he was saying the, the earth will fade away, the heavens and the earth will fade away, but none, none of his word will fade away is what he's saying. Hallelujah. That's why. So that's why you want to be in the Word. Even Paul said, uh, renew your mind daily. And he's telling Timothy, obviously that's for us too, study to show yourself approved. Okay, so this is what we're saying. You put the heart, and then David, he says, hide the Word in your heart. As he's talking to God, he says, thy Word, I've hidden, I've hidden in my heart. So that's what we want to do. Because literally, if the Word, the Bible as we know it here, if it was taken away, would you know what Jesus told you to do? Would you know what Father God expects out of you? Would you know who Holy Spirit is? Would you know any of the word at all? Okay, would you know what to do? So, uh, like here, and then this other part here I want to mention, he says in, in verse 10 here, get the hint, Satan. He told, he told him to take a hike. Get behind him. Right? What Satan was offering him was worldly things and temporal things. Because we know this world, the heavens and the earth, is going to be rolled up like a scroll and just dissolved. A word tells you this. And a new heaven and a new earth will come down. That's where you get the new Jerusalem. And that's where you get at the end of all of this. Um, Father God is going to relocate. He's going to come live with us and among us. We'll be able to go to that throne room anytime we want to, physically. Isn't that awesome? Jesus will be living with us. He'll hand all authority back over to the Father, and then he'll be our brother. He'll always be our Savior. He'll always be our friend. He'll always be our advocate. He'll always be all those things. But he'd be our brother too. Can you imagine when the, the day that we we will live in? We'll live in glory and might and majesty. And there will be no evil. Because the word says even back in Revelation that nothing that defileth, nothing that is a lie, nothing that is sin is going to enter into his kingdom. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. So he's telling us, he's told us that what he does and what he has done, his believers, his followers, his children, 
right? They will do what he does. So you have to remember that. So he's telling us we're going to do. So we have, that's our responsibility. That's why we have free choice and free will. Okay, so our wilderness is where we learn to rely on him. Jesus told us what to do, and we have to learn them. And that's true. That's so true. He's told us what to do. We have to study the word to know what to do, what God expects out of us. Hallelujah. Thank you for the word, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and, and dying that horrid death for us. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here. Teach us, lead us, and guide us. So we're going to look at John 14, verse 12. John 14, verse 12. Verily I, verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Yes, yeah, because he go to his Father. Now, he's telling, he's taught them there, but he's teaching us through this word, obviously. And we will do the same things that he has done. Not because we're greater than him, it's because Holy Spirit is here and living in us now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, yes, we are supposed to do those things. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and 14. First Corinthians 10. Let's see here. Thirteen and fourteen. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. That is so awesome. And see, he tells us how to do this too. How to flee. How? Look at this. That's why we want to do word studies. Because he tells us what to do and how to do it. Okay, James 4, 7 to 8. James 4, 7 to 8. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and you devil, uh, and purify your hearts. Cleanse your hands, you you sinners, and purify your hearts, you devil-minded. Sorry about that, Reed. <laughs> but uh, you know what? I'm going to clarify what double-minded is. Okay, double-minded is when, okay, you know exactly what to do. Holy Spirit told you what to do. You go to do it. And then someone else says, oh, I think it would work better this way. Or I think it would be faster to do it this way. And then you go do what he said instead of what God said. That is double-minded, my friend. And you do not want to be that way. We're being warned about it right here. And I do have a video on my YouTube list. Just look down at, I don't remember what it was named, but probably Double Minded, something about Double Minded. But I talked about this exact thing and explained it further. So that's what Double Minded is. And, and you definitely do not want to be Double Minded because you'll be spit out of God's mouth. Okay, after the wilderness experience is where you must learn to totally rely on him, you will uh, burst out into experiences. Doors will open, doors will close. That's a, just a natural thing. To th it's just a natural thing. You know, when, when it's time to move on, doors are going to close, and you're going to get frustrated because you can't get to that, through that door. So that's one thing. And Apostle Paul, he knew when the door was closed and it was time for him to move on and we're going to look at that too Romans 15 21 to 23 
21 to 23. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand, for which cause also I have been hindered from coming to you. But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you, that's when he's saying that I will come to you. And see, he's saying, having no more place in these parts. The doors were closed to him. People had gotten what they wanted out of him. People have learned what they wanted out of him. And people decided, not everybody obviously, but people decided that's enough. Don't want no more. Go away. The door was closed. In other words, they wouldn't, uh, they, they wouldn't hear him anymore. Okay. That we are given authority to cast out demons. Obviously, um, there's more to this authority. So you, when you accept Christ as your Savior, he gives you authority. Authority, yeah, authority for what? Authority over demons, to cast demons out, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, just like he says, to spread the word. He gives you authority to stand up for righteousness. Okay, it all comes down to a heart issue. How much time, how much energy, you know, how much time are you going to spend praying in your native language or praying in tongues? And it's better to pray in tongues because if you pray in your native language, Satan and demons can understand what you're saying and they can thwart the word of God. Not the word of God, I'm sorry, the work of God, the plan of God. They can put roadblocks in your way. Now, the reason why... There is so much um, grief given when I talk about or when other space talk about, uh, you know, tongue, the gift of tongues. Now, we know that one, this one spirit, Holy Spirit, manifests in several different ways or many different ways in this case, many different ways. Okay, and one of them gifts that we've been given is a gift of tongues. Okay, and the when you speak in tongues, you're letting the Holy Spirit speak through you to Father God. The demons and Satan cannot understand that language. Therefore, they can't put roadblocks in your way. So, let me tell you, the, the gift of tongues, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, oh, what is the other one? Oh yeah, Holy Spirit baptism and and Holy Spirit drawing you to repentance is all one and the same is what people say. It's not. It's two different separate experiences. It takes Holy Spirit to draw you to repentance. It takes Holy Spirit to draw you to the cross. Okay, to Jesus. And it takes Holy Spirit to have you, you know, to open up your spiritual understanding, to have you understand that you need salvation, that you need forgiveness, and that you need Jesus. See, that's one experience. And then the water baptism is for everybody around you. It's a public acknowledgement that you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Hallelujah. And the point of that is you go down, it represents his burial, and you come up, it rep represents his resurrection. His life, he's living, he's alive. It represents his living. And then, then you say, you know, there's more. I started researching. I wanted to know what was, what was out there. What did he have? I wanted to know these things. And I had all these questions. And I went to pillars of the church. I went to pastors. I went to ministers. I went to people that know the word. Nobody could tell me these answers. Holy Spirit revealed it to me years later. See, it took me two years to get the Holy Spirit. And, and that's where um, I'm going to jump to this right now. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 comes in. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he cometh to God, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I loved God. I was baptized. I was searching. But I didn't understand that he was 
there all the time wanting to give it to me, wanting to indwell me, wanting to give me more and more, right? And then after I learned, Paul says it made it worse for my searching and my desperation because I was thinking first I, I wasn't good enough and I was doing something wrong. Like I said, I just shared with you in Hebrews here, he is there. He's willing. We have to be willing. Even though I had the faith there, I didn't understand how that worked. But literally, he's wait, God is waiting there to give you more of him. It's a heart issue. You have to desire more. He will never force himself on you. Him, Holy Spirit, and <laughs> Jesus, they will never force themselves on anyone. That's why you have free will and free choice. So when you, when you ask him for his baptism of his Holy Spirit, as after you learn, now it's not wrote in stone, mind you. Some people aren't baptized. Some people are hooked up to tubes. Some people die right after they accept Christ. So nothing is a, just like the thief on the cross. He said, God, he said, remember me, right? And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, right? He could come up that cross and get dunked underwater, Right? But but he was saved. And the thing is, the people with that are on their deathbed, they accept Christ. They're not able to get dunked. Come on, let's use common sense. Common sense tells you that if you think about it. You know, it's not wrote in stone. That's why I said it's a heart issue. Some people, when they're looking for Christ, you know, and looking for more of him, uh, you know, they accept Jesus as their Savior, and then automatically... Holy Spirit will indwell him and start speaking through him. When he's praising Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, I love you, Lord. And Holy Spirit will speak up, will speak through you in an unlearned language. See, it's not all wrote in stone, like I said, but it is a second experience. That's all there is to it. It is a second experience. And you have to stay under the blood covenant. Because you can walk away, you can deny Christ, you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, in this life, nor in the next life, will you be forgiven if you blast me, Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people say, I think I've lived, I'm so worried, I'm so worried. Well, wait a minute. If you're worried about your concern and you're still loving him, you did not blaspheme him. Because he takes the spirit from you. Now, the blasphemy means you take something that's pure and holy, Holy Spirit's pure and holy, and you come against it, start making it into something that is evil, that's blasphemy. Remember that. So, uh, when you accept Christ as your Savior, He gives you authority over demons, over you know, over demons. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, and you know that, like I said, when you're praising Jesus, uh, Holy Spirit will speak through you, through your mouth, through your tongue. You have to yield yourself. You have to yield yourself. Yield your tongue. Holy Spirit will speak through you in an unlearned language. The demons cannot understand it. Satan can't understand it, so they can't put um, roadblocks in front of you or, like I said, thwart or stop the, the plan of God because they don't know what he said. Now, when you pray in your native language, they do understand what you're saying, and therefore they can make you think that you're not hearing from God, that you haven't heard him, that you don't know what you're talking about, and all those negative things. And by the way, if you get a negative, di if you get a diagnosis, a label, a negative word, refuse it immediately because there's always a demon behind it. And if it, if it festers in you, you accept it as your own. It, it stays in your soul and it will create, well, it will create soul wounds. It creates a crack as soon as you accept that and say that's yours, like accept it. That's why as soon as you hear it, you say, I refuse to accept that. I'm a child of God. And then you, I refuse to accept it. Get behind me. I cast you out. So you, as soon as you do hear that, you cast it out. You say, I do not accept you. I cast you out. But if you say, I, oh, I understand. I accept that. My parents had this. My, my, uh, my, uh, yeah. Ancestors had this, or my aunt had this, whatever. You're accepting that, and it creates a crack in your in your soul. And they're called once you, you don't immediately or they or rip that out and say cast that out. It will create soul wounds, and then eventually, because you don't deal with it or you won't deal with it for some reason, 
or you don't know how to deal with it. It will fester in there and it'll create disease. That's where depression comes from. That's where schizophrenia comes from. That's where all these things, that's all this stuff comes from. Because see, once it's cracked and once you don't take care of it, and once you don't cast a demon out, and then once it stays and it festers, more demons attract are attracted to that crack. More demons will come in. Research that. Do a word study. So when you accept Christ, like I said, he gives you the power over demons, power to cast out demons, power to raise the dead and heal the sick. And you're not healing them. You're allowing God to work through you to heal a person. Remember that. Never accept it. Always give glory to God. Because you got some negative consequences coming if you don't. It's always his glory. Always to his glory. It's always because of him. Amen. And it is always because of him. Now, when you ask for Holy Spirit, or when Holy Spirit comes and lives in you, he does not do it automatically because you've got free will and free choice. It's a heart issue. If you're open to him and you're a willing vessel, like I'm a willing vessel, and I've learned to give up everything, I'm a willing vessel, and he can use me however he wants to. When Holy Spirit comes to live in you, he starts speaking through you. Paul says it's a down payment for eternal salvation. That's how you know you have eternal salvation. And the only way that you can lose your salvation is like I just told you. Blaspheme Holy Spirit. Walk away and deny Christ. You know, and the way, the way you walk away is, think about this. you got something that you're doing and the Holy Spirit's telling you, or you've been told over and over and over that's wrong, shown in Scripture, Holy Spirit keeps telling you and nagging at you, stop that, stop that, repent, and making you feel bad every time you do it. But you keep doing it and you ignore Holy Spirit. That means that you love that sin more than you love Jesus. That, more, that means that you want the world more than you want Him. That means you lost your salvation because you chose to walk away. He will never rip it from you. So there goes out the door that salvation, once saved, always saved. Because that once saved, always saved doctrine is from the pits of hell. And it is literally telling you, you can do whatever you want, to whoever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want. That's okay. You can still enter into heaven, into God's holy abode when you die. And that word die, I don't like using. I've said that several videos I don't like using it because the spirit and the soul never die. But it's a term to understand when your body deceases or when something's deceased, like an animal's spirit comes out of their body. The body is the body dies for old age or for whatever ran over by a car. I don't know. Whatever the case is, look just like us, we can get into a car accident and our body deceases, our spirit and soul come out. Now Paul said you will be known as you are known, so don't believe if somebody says well, your soul stays here with your um, with your body when you die, and it's put in the ground yet. That is a total lie also. Paul said you will be known as you are known. We're not robots. That's why we have free will and free choice. God could have made us robots, programmed what he wanted us to do, but he wanted us to love him for who he is, not for what he does. The same thing with our spirit and our soul. They're intertwined together. Your soul is your mind, will, and intellect. That's where your emotions sit. And that's the part that I talk about the most in my um, book. And I have six-part video series on my YouTube channel. So you can look through that. And my book will be out here in about two days, by the way. Not two days, about two months or so. Because it's in the last part of editing. But the fact is, that is extremely important to understand because the soul wound, see, that affects your relationships, your daily life, your jobs. If you've got a career, your career, your children's lives, your life, your marriage, your spouse. So it affects every aspect of your life. Spirit, soul, and body. Your emotions. Like I said, the emotion part of your soul gets hurt. And if you don't deal with that, it creates soul wounds. And I just explained that a little bit ago to you. Now, this is what I'm saying. When Holy Spirit comes to live in you, he gives you power. So, okay, I used to say power. Power for what? All right? Power to live a victorious life. 
So if you look back here in Revelation, which is another scripture I don't have for it down, but I'm going to look for it. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. This is how you can say that. Because when you have Holy Spirit living in you, you can, you know, you can live the victorious life. You live with power, great power, power to overcome, power to overcome obstacles, power to overcome this world system, power to overcome um, negativity that's thrown at you and the arrows that are thrown at you and the, the relationships that are ungodly. But it's power to overcome, power to be bold, power to stand up for righteousness, power to spread the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's power, power to continue, power to continue on in your journey. Because each one of us have a journey to fulfill before it's our time to go. So, you know, once we've learned these things, and believe me, there's going to be lots more to learn. There are lots more to learn than what I'm just sharing with you. We're going to be learning on into eternity. Praise God. We'll never be bored. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 14, verse 11. For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humble himself shall be humbled. And that is so important to understand, and that's also the exact same saying in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. We have to stay humble, we have to stay repentant, we have to stay under the blood covenant of Christ. Okay, and I relate this, and I relate this what I just read to you, to uh, the wedding guest. Okay, remember, the king came in, which is representative of Jesus, and he asked the wedding guest. He's saying, friend, how did you get in here? You have no wedding garment on. Well, then I have to say, what is that wedding garment? Now, wedding garment is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, he says, I, he says, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness where there is weeping of, uh, a weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's where you're going to stay if you don't have Holy Spirit indwelling because he's not playing and he's not kidding. His word says that we need to be born again. If you look at uh, John chapter one where he's taught where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. I don't have this one wrote down either, but I'm gonna go through to this for you. Check this out. I have it marked, but I don't have it in my notes. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that Thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say to thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canneth not tell where it cometh from, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? And I'm going to come back to that in a second. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do not know, and testify that we have seen, 
do know. We speak of that thing we do know and testify of the thing we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Now we're going to go back here. Nicodemus is asking him how. How? Jesus says to him, listen to this. Art thou a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? Remember, there are false witnesses, false teachers, false evangelists, false prophets. And I had heard of too many evangelists that are false. Because it takes a special mighty anointing. And he says in the next verse, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Think about that. That saddens my heart, and I want to cry. He was in the ministry all his life. And that's what happens back then. The year, the years go by and it goes father to son to find, you know and down the line. Yeah, he don't know, and he had a scripture in front of him. This is why I say too that when when you read something, read scripture. You can read a verse, you can read a line, you can read a chapter, you can read a book. It don't matter. When you read it and you reread it and then you read it again. That's why I always that's why I always ask for Holy Spirit protection and for him teaching you. Because, to open up your understanding, because you can read it many times over and then you go back to read it again. And Holy Spirit will reveal another aspect. Don't put Holy Spirit in a box, just like you don't put God in a box. You said people say, well, he didn't mean that, he didn't mean that, he didn't say that. Well, wait a minute, it is said this this way here, but if you go back and you research the meaning or the tradition or who's being talked to, the, the hermeneutics, the culture, why that was said, the original word, the meaning of the word in, in the Bible, right? The biblical meaning of the word, the original wor wor root word even, it will tell you exactly what Holy Spirit is telling you without doing all that work. If that makes sense, you still want to do the Bible studies and word studies and the, all the sort of things I just mentioned. But I'm telling you that he has layers and he will reveal to you as you need it. Not as you deem it necessary or you want it. If you ask him for it, that's one thing. But he, as you read it, he will reveal truth to you. So never put him in a box and say, no, that didn't happen. And you don't know but one line out of a verse. Wow. That's why the word says, don't argue with a fool. So we're going to look at Matthew 24, 13. Because see, these scriptures I'm going to show you next tell you to stay in Christ. And then that goes back to where I said you can lose your salvation. Okay, we're going to go back to Matthew 24, 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We're going to go to Corinthians 15, verse 57 and 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 and 58. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And there's another scripture that he did, which I don't know if I could find it quick. It's in Corinthians. And he says, uh, he says, um, he keeps under his body, and he keeps his body in subjection, at least at any time, after he's preached to others, he finds himself a castaway. Now, if that was once saved, always saved, and that was all there was to it, 
I accept him. I accept him as Savior. I know he is, but in your heart, you didn't do anything in your heart. Your heart is not uh, where your mouth is. Your mouth is just giving lip service, in other words. You're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself if you don't think the rest of the word is, uh, is needed. In the rest of the word, let me see if I can find that. It's in Corinthians, I know it. Let me see. I don't like doing this with my fingers. If I keep my keep uh under my body. Yeah, that's what it is. First Corinthians nine twenty seven. First Corinthians nine twenty seven. I'll put that down there too. I always refer, well, I refer to it quite often, but I don't know why I always forget it. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. All right, it's only a couple pages back. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, if you go down and look at my videos, uh, I don't remember, probably halfway down the list, it says, can salvation be lost? And it's got every single scripture. So you must stay humble. You must uh, stay repentant. And you must stay under the blood covenant of Jesus. Okay, so one, that one saved, always saved. I just blew it out of the water. Oh, God, move this chair up. So remember, Jesus said that not his will be done, but God's will. In fact, you know, when... Uh, uh, in Matthew, this one I'm talking about specifically is in Matthew chapter 26, is verse 39, 42, and 44. And he was saying, not my will, but your will. And But John 3.30, we will go to. He must increase, but I must decrease. you got to get out of the way. You have to learn to rely on him and just believe that what his word says is true and that he hears you. And, and there's another one um, for that fact, now that that's brought up. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I think it's 56. Or 64. 64. I'll find it here real quick and I'll tell you. Okay. It's Isaiah 65, verse 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. I'll write that down too before I forget it. Isaiah 65, verse 24. This is what he wants. He wants you, and I've already read that, Hebrews 6, uh, uh, 11, 6, where when you come to him, you must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I can tell you through experience, I, I, it's true. If you, if you go in repentant, humble, and diligently seek him, just like, uh, just like Matthew 6, 33 says, And I quote that one off my hand mind, but I'll go ahead and go to it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You see? So, see, he will reward you. He will reward you. Okay, and then the other one is, uh, so it's proof after proof after proof. And I'm only giving you a few of them. So if you go back to James 2 and then verse 23. And the scriptures was fulfilled, which saith Abraham, believe God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. 
And he was called the friend of God. I don't know about you, but I want to be called the friend of God. And we know also that the disciples were everyday people. You know, they weren't clergy or anything like that. God uses the humble. And I can relate that back to uh, the feasts. The, the, the feast where... Uh, you know, a feast was given, and all these people came, and Jesus said, when you come, I'm just paraphrasing this, but when you come, don't go up to the first seat, the best seat in the house, or at the, at the, at the event, because somebody, he, the, the uh, host may have invited someone that was worthier or more upstanding than you, and then you're going to be humiliated when the host says, friend, give up your seat to him. You see what I mean? This is what he's saying about do not exalt yourself. He will exalt you. Same thing with if you're prideful and arrogant and you're, you know, you bring, you're exalting yourself. Or others are exalting you. He says, don't do that. First off, it's a sin. And second, he's saying don't do that because he will humble you. Me, I would rather stay humble and repentant and under the blood covenant of Christ and searching and just praising him rather than him come to me and say, smack you down because you're, uh, you, I don't accept you because you're humble and arrogant. I don't know where that one came from, but that I don't want that to happen to anyone. You know, and the fact is, you know, God can use anyone, it's obvious, God can use anyone that he desires to use for whichever plan he wants to use. Okay, we know, like I said, the, the, son, the disciples were common people with common lives, but God used them, right? So... You have to stay humble. Um, so, you know, like I said, there's more to learn. But it's all free will. It's all through your free will. And, you know, I've learned. You've got to learn to lean into your faith. Now, I've learned, and I'm still working on it. I'm not perfect at, yet in this aspect. But from the beginning of 2023 until now I've been in the hospital for two long stays and I have had learn I have learned and I have had to learn that it is not me that's doing it it's not people that's doing it it was the prayers of the saints it was the prayers of the folks that that uh, prayed for me first off and took me to the throne room and it was through the grace of God was literally I shouldn't be here so it's in his time. It's just like with, with my eyes. The word says, and, and the word says, one day with us is a thousand years to him. So he doesn't live inside of time. You know that box? Time and space and death and width and breath, all that. He lives outside of that. Humans are the ones that live inside because we live on this earth. It's because he gave us a body to live in. So we can make that choice. That's why I say, um, you know, you you will be known as you are known. That means our emotions and everything about us, our features, you know, our, our emotions, how we think, our intellect, in other words, is going to go with us. And so um, I think that's about all I need to say on that one. Except that, except what I wanted to say about faith I learned to lean into it. Because don't let nobody tell you that you don't have faith. Over and over and over, people kept saying, it's your fault, Kathy, you're not healed. It's your fault. And I said, well, wait a minute. I have the faith because every time I've asked for him to heal me, he's healed me. Now, Jesus, I mean, Father God, he has given me several visions now. And he's put me in four situations that that mimic those visions that I've been given where I have have. I'm praising him, and all of a sudden I realize my eyesight's clear. 
and I'm focusing clear because it's so dry right now. They're not focusing, especially this one. And and uh, my eyesight's are perfect. I'm seeing perfect. All right. So he's given me four situations, four circumstances, since he's given me those several dreams or visions. I call them visions. So, but he, you know, it's in his timing, not my timing. I want it right now. He says, I'm going to use you. My husband, too, for all this time, he's been begging God to heal my eyes. And he, and God told him finally, because Jan told me this the other day, he said, he's the Holy Spirit, told him very clearly, stop, stop, stop praying. Stop praying for her eyes. She's healed. We've been, We've told her told her she's healed stop doing it so he stopped doing it and then I stopped asking sometimes I'll ask because <laughs> it's hard on me to wait but you know it's his timing and I know his words true I know he's true I know he loves his children I know he hears us I know he hears our cries and the word says even David said my tears you put in that bottle to write him in that book. He's got a book that for tears, for crying, for prayers. He's got a book of life. He's got a book, you know, if you're not written, if you're not found written in the book of life, you won't gain entrance into, into the kingdom of heaven. Which means if the rapture happened today, you'd be left behind. I pray that you aren't left behind. I pray that you ask him for more of him. And it's a, like I said, it's a hard issue. You ask for more of him. You study, you research, and all I've been telling you, you keep praying and you, you ask for the gift of tongues. And, you know, Holy Spirit is one spirit that manifests in different ways. Like I said, that is a down payment. So gift of tongues is a down payment. That's how you know you have eternal salvation. But he also teaches and guides and leads and protects and be your best friend. And he'll give you discernment you know, discernment. He'll give you the gift of discernment, the gift of uh, interpreting tongues, the gift of tongues, like when you're, you're in a, um, the gift of prophecy, in other words, but when you're in a service for one, for one example, and I've been in many services like this, where it got cold, we're just praising him, we're all in one accord, and it got totally, I'm talking about quiet, I'm talking about nothing moved, I don't even think that uh, a mouse moved. It was there. But nothing moved. N nothing. You're in twilight zone. I nothing moved. It was so quiet. All of a sudden, there'll be one standing up. One person stands up and they'll speak in tongues. And there'll be a perfect language. And then they'll sit down and another person, mind you, is still real quiet. Another person will stand up and then they'll speak in a, uh, they'll speak in a, language another unknown language to them but another language and somebody will get up and say this is what they said god is saying and when this person stands up and and says what they said they could have been saying it in two different languages but that one person that stands up after that and says god says so that means both these people that stood up in different languages they're saying the same thing the one in english is saying God said, so that's a gift of tongues. That's a gift of interpretation of tongues. That's a gift of prophecy. And other other times, like when you're in a service and you're talking to somebody, you're praying for somebody, and the Holy Spirit starts talking through you, it could be speaking in German. That's just an example, or a Spanish, or whatever. And there's somebody there, another person there that's, that's uh, Spanish, speaks Spanish, or another person there that their native tongue is German. And then that person will come to you and say, I know exactly what you were saying. Uh, I'm German. I'm, you were speaking fluent. Like I like I know uh, this, this one lady, it was over a decade ago now, the church down in Old Town, and she passed away. Her name's Barbara, but she passed away. But she said, she testified that she went to Russia and she was participated in a meeting, one of the speakers. And she was talking to someone, whatever she, and she was praying, and then she started, whatever she was doing, but she started speaking in their native language. And mind you, she didn't know nothing about it. She had an interpreter. She started speaking in clear, fluent Russian. 
okay, she's talking to this, this person that's in line that she's praying for. She starts, the Holy Spirit starts speaking in clear Russian fluently to this person that she's praying for. Her interpreter is standing right here. Her interpreter takes her by the arm and shakes her and says, do you know what you're doing? Do you know what you're doing? I want to tell you about an experience I had. And she, she come out of it, like snapped out of it. Because when you do that to somebody that's in the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit speaking, that knocks him out of that connection with God. So she come out and she says, what are you doing? And so this interpreter had to interpret the whole time afterwards, right? So you know that was Holy Spirit. And then that man understood everything. When she was praying for understood every bit, every bit, every word. Now I'll tell you real quick before I end the video. We were down and this other person has passed away. God bless his soul. Uh, we were at a church we were attending for quite a while. And they were, you know, it was just, all they had was a CD player. So they were playing, it wasn't secular music, but it was praise and worship music. I don't know, I remember at this time what it was even. The Holy Spirit came all in, right? And uh, we were praising him. Some people were quiet, I noticed. Some people were praising him in tongues. Some people were just saying hallelujah, whatever. And we, some of us went up to the front. Well, I did. And that's not me. Normally, no, I don't, normally it's not me. But I've done that a couple times since this. Well, prior to this, did a couple times. But nobody uh, interrupted me until afterwards, thank God. But this time I'm talking about now, I was up in front and I was praising God and had my hands up. And I was totally surrendered to him. Jesus, have your way. Jesus, have your way in this video too. Touch the people that are listening. Touch their heart. Sever that connection right now, Father, from the world. From ungodly soul ties. From anything that is hindering them or me from worshiping you, from speaking in tongues, from having your Holy Spirit, from infilling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Jesus' name. So I, I all of a sudden, I, I just, when I was worshiping, I was, I was lost in the presence of God. He was surrounding me. And I started, and I'm not a dancer. <laughs> I'm awkward. I was not a dancer. I started dancing like a ballerina. I was dancing. I was praising him and I was my eyes were closed and I was in another world. And this he's not a pastor, but they called him pastor. He came up to me. Literally, he did the same thing. He took my arm and he shook me so hard. He shook me violent. <laughs> He was still doing it when I came up out of that connection was broken. I came up out of it. That's how I knew he was violently shaking me. And, and I'm like, what? 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 I'm looking. You know? Oh. And he says, Do you you're still shaking me? Do you know what you're doing? Do you know what you're doing? Do you know what you're doing? You never do that. Never do that. And I, if you're familiar with Perry Stone, I love the man. Perry Stone and his ministry. He's got a lot of excellent books and excellent DVDs and stuff out there. And um, I was listening to a testimony. He was on a on, on Manifest. That's where he, his show is Manifest. I was listening to Manifest, and it was when his father was alive, I believe. Yeah, his father was alive. Fred Stone. So he's passed away now. But um, he was... He was talking about his experience, or oh, his father's experience. His father was a young minister, and um, anyways, they were praising God. The service was over, but he was still praising God. He was lost in speaking in tongues. He was lost in the Holy Spirit. This is what was related after the fact. The minister closed up. Everybody left except this other man that was there in Usher, and the minister minister says I gotta go home I have some thing, obligations I have to do so he said he went ahead and closed up he asked this other this other uh, man to stand to stay with Fred because he didn't know how long he was going to be lost in the Holy Spirit 
in the Holy Spirit. By this time, it was going on into five hours, from what I was told, five hours that um, Fred Stone was laying on his back on the floor and the Holy Spirit was speaking through them, through him, I mean. And so the man, the other man was just watching him. He said that his head, he started disappearing from his head. His, his head was almost disappeared. You remember where, uh, uh, I'm not no, uh, Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was no more because uh, God was pleased with him. God translated him. I believe that would have happened to Fred Stone that night if this man hadn't done this. Don't ever stop me if I cross over. Don't ever stop me if I'm so lost in his word and so lost in his spirit that I start disappearing, literally. He come over to him. He started shaking him. Fred, 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 Fred. You're disappearing. Come back, come back. I guess it took a little bit of him shaking. But he came back. And this man doing this to Fred broke that connection. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us for not knowing you on an intimate level. And by the way, I will say one more thing, and then I'll close here, the prayer. When Jesus says to these people in Revelation and in Matthew, he says, depart, he said, depart from me, I never knew you. I'll make this short. The people are saying, well, why didn't I do this? Didn't I cast out demons? Didn't I heal sick? Didn't I do this? Didn't I feed the hungry? Didn't I go to prisons to minister to them? Didn't I do this? He'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Why? Why would he say that? Why would he say that to those people? Because they were not filled with his Holy Spirit. They did not have that intimate relationship. And that's what he is looking for. That intimate relationship is like a husband. If you go back, let me say this. If you go back and you do, you do word study on know, knowing, and knew, N-E-W, K-N-E-W, I mean, it's all the same. It's a knowing of each other, an intimate knowing, an interlocking. The only way that can be explained is when you look at uh, what he did with the man and the woman in, uh, well, how it started, obviously, in Genesis. That knowing that he wants is that intimate relationship he wants to live inside of you. And the closest thing that anyone can put those together and to understand is the relationship, the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. Okay, so you've got a man and you got a woman and you have to have intercourse in order to have that intimate relationship. This is what Jesus is talking about several times. Even in uh, when he's talking to Nicodemus, you must be born again. People say, oh, I got baptized, so I'm born again. Remember, I just told you and explained to you that that baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second experience. So even Jesus, he had to be baptized because he said, Let, he told John, let's fulfill, do it to fulfill the law. All the righteousness of the law. He said, do it to fulfill all the righteousness of the law. And that's what they were doing. And that's why he was water baptized when he came up holy spirit landed on him even though now jesus and john the baptist were the only two people in history two two people two people ever to be filled with holy spirit before they were born so they were filled with holy spirit from the time of conception which brings it down to that's murder when you do abortion and it's the same thing is as, as uh we call it in the old testament Passing the children through the fire of Moloch. Exact same thing. Go and do some research on that. So this is why it's so abominable to murder. It's so abominable to do abortion. It's so abominable to uh, do infanticide or genocide. Right? 
Think about that. Go back and do your own research. And I'll leave it at that. But that intimate relationship is what he wants. And that's why they didn't enter in. See, and even Paul said, if there wasn't another day of rest, you can even relate that to, like I just said, there's a different experience between water, accepting, well, there's a different experience between recognizing your sorrow and repenting, or recognizing your sin and repenting, recognizing your need for a savior, the, the getting baptized, well, actually recognizing your need for a savior, then accepting Christ as your savior, or Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus as your savior, and then you recognize him as, your, as the Christ, the savior of the world, or your savior, and then to, to be water baptized, that's another experience, and to be filled with his Holy Spirit, doesn't matter if it's instant, or you wait two years like I did, for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He's always waiting for you to accept him and to say, I want you. That's a totally another experience. Just like the anointing. So you got an anointing. You were given an anointing to spread the word when you accepted him. He gave you authority over demons and this I told you. He gave you that anointing to spread the word. Now there's another anointing, another baptism with an anointing, which is when you teaching the word or when you're up in a pulpit it comes over you so there's anointing that's in you to teach the word to share your word there's anointing that comes over you to preach the word to evangelize the word etc to be a pastor but there again you got to let holy spirit have his way you can't keep quenching the spirit paul said in first thessalonians 5 uh, 16, I think it was, in that area. It says, quench not, the whole, quench not the Spirit. He said, pray without ceasing. Well, that's another thing. How can you pray without ceasing unless you have Holy Spirit in you? Unless you got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like I said, that's a different experience. And then the anointing.